Hey there, everyone. Welcome to What You're Watching with Jamie and Bo. I'm Bo. And I'm Jamie. And this is the only show that I'm aware of that begins with one simple question. Hey, Jamie, what you been watching? A whole lot of found footage. Yeah? Yeah, well, because that's our theme for the month of October. Uh, We are doing, Brian and I are doing what we found on Halloween. So every night we are alternating choices of found footage films. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's mostly what I've been doing. I mean, we squeeze other things in there, you know, as as it happens. We started. We watched the two, the first two episodes of Chapel Wait last night. How Did is that? that? I haven't watched it yet. I mean, it's the middle of October. I can't. I can't watch anything no, bad I, on a list right now. I understand that I, fully, but. Brian really wanted to carve out time to watch it. And the unfortunate thing is they only have the first two episodes on Amazon. So we're going to have to either get epics to watch the rest of it or hope that it comes out some other way or something. How was it? But it was good. I, I, so far I really, really like it. Uh, I like period pieces anyway. I like Adrian Brody. Um, It's, it kind of reminds me at times it reminds me of like an episode of Little Owls on the Prairie, but if people were really fucking mean. Uh, this town, it's your typical small-minded, you know, we're Christians town yeah. where when other people who aren't like them move into the town, it's like, what kind of Christian are you, you know? Uh uh, God, they just, it, 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 you, they make you want to punch them in the face, basically. But you've got that going on. And, and uh, th- there's the, the house, Chapel Wait, which has this whole almost like hill house, uh, uh, mm, what do you call it, reputation uh, in the town. And they think that there's an illness that's been going through the town. And they think that this family is responsible for it. I mean, this, it's all your typical, like I said, small minded bullshit, but I, I really like it. And uh, I hope that we will eventually get to watch more of it because that is pretty good. I, yeah. I've heard uh, good things about it. And I'm a big fan of Jerusalem's lot, the story that it's taken from. And in fact, I had one of those uh, night shift audiobook collections, and, and I, like I read yeah. night shift a, a bunch of times. But they had, I think it was Jerusalem's Lot was one of the stories. I think I'm the Doorway was one of them. At any rate, uh, but Jerusalem's Lot, I listened to the audiobook of that a bunch. And yeah, Brian's a big fan of that. That's why he wanted to push so hard to watch it even though there's so much other stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. But I always liked it. I always liked that it was kind of this weird blend of, you know, there's some witchcraft stuff and then there's some Lovecraftian, hey, there are dead people knocking around in the walls and whatnot. You know, you got to get in there with a broom, shoo them out. Um, get on out of here, corpses, they say. Um, and then there was, you know, the, the curse. Get on out of here. Get on out of here. Um, and then, you know, the cursed town with the book of the worm and all that stuff, you know, it was a, it was a fun blend of sort of Lovecraftian elements and, uh, just sort of traditional Gothic horror. It was, I always enjoyed that story a lot. So I'll get to that. It's one of those things, like if it ever pops up on Amazon, I'll just buy the whole season, you know? Yeah. I, uh, I I keep wanting to sing the Downton Worms, the song you know from lear the white worm because they keep saying the worm is coming yeah. you know what and, and every, i just want to break into song but yeah that well yeah. that's what happens yeah. at the end of that uh the, the story at the end of some slot the, the worm shows up and everybody dances yeah uh i don't know that anybody <laughs> was dancing i think it was more that uh calvin ends up getting <laughs> killed and then boone uh retires back to chapel weight and then i think if memory serves, I, I think that he's going into the cellar. You know, it's one of those, the the story itself was one of those epistolary stories where uh, it was like, and I'm going to de- descend in the cellar. And or I maybe he just threw himself off the cliff or something. Like it was a suicide note or something. And then the whole thing ends with a new diary 
where it's a guy saying, oh, my my ancestor thought he was ending the bloodline when he jumped off this cliff, but it turns out that I'm like a second cousin twice removed and I'm going to move into chapel weight now. And by the way, I hear these rats in the walls and it's like, Oh, it, it begins anew. Um, so anyway, that's what happened in the story. Spoilers for chapel weight. If that's what they do, <laughs> but uh, all right, so I have been speaking of found footage. Jokes on you! I stopped listening like thirty seconds in. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's I kid. Us. I get that's that's uh, because the listeners, for some reason, love to see you get like dunked on. I don't know why, but yeah. usually by Duncan, <laughs> Duncan dunks. Does uh, Duncan listen to this show? Probably fuck not. Him, fuck him if he doesn't. But I just you know. Yeah, I he probably listens to this as much as I listen to podcast under the stairs. Oh yeah, me too. You know, like I listen, <laughs> I there, I listen to the ones that you're on. No, 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 no. I don't uh, like to. Come li- on, I- no, I don't like to listen to stuff that I'm on. Um, I listen to like the summer series. I'll listen to the episodes that I'm not on. Um, and because I was there and I know what happened, but. I listen to it. It depends on the episode. Like I listen to all the Bazooine stuff and you know, it depends. Like I, I have only so much time and so I can't listen to every episode of anything, but I listen. Yeah. You know, I, I try listen to listen to, to I listen to teapots. Here's the thing is I don't like listening to shows that I'm on. I don't do it. And I do listen to them. Not because it's like an ego thing, but because I am just trying to remember if I said something stupid because I never know. And so what, what I think is hilarious is people will come to me and it's like, oh, this was cracking me up on the show. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't even remember saying that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad that they enjoy it. But, I, you know, things just fall out of my mouth and I don't even know what they are. And I have to even our show. Seriously, you drop it the very next day. I have to listen to it first thing in the morning because I can't remember a thing I said the night before. Yeah, I, that's true. It's pretty sad. <laughs> well, no, I, there's something about being in the midst of a recording where you're having a conversation. Well, it's like asking somebody, hey, do you remember the details of this conversation you had last week? And it's like, I kind of generally remember what we talked about, but I couldn't tell you word for word what I said. And But the same thing will happen where somebody will quote me like some ridiculous shit I said mm-hmm. and be like, this was amazing. I'm like, I have no recollection of saying that, but it sounds like me. It sounds like, yeah, something I, I mean, say. I believe you because yeah. it sounds like something that I would say, but I can't swear that I said it. Plus, you know? plus as I get older, my brain is smoothing out real good. Uh, yeah. Like I'm, I'm getting one of them <laughs> horror exp- express brains where yeah. you just <laughs> suck the memory right out of me and it just turns into a big grape in my head. Father Time is just rolling those rollers over the top, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Like Steamrolling it, spackling all the grooves out of it. Uh, oh, which reminds me, we're watching yeah. the visit tonight. That's the that's we haven't watched it. Wait, did we watch it? No, we did already watch. It. <laughs> that has. See? Yeah, See? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not a giant fan of that movie, but I am an enormous fan of that kid getting a diaper in the face. Oh man, ho! It, that, that kid, that kid cracks me up. I like that kid. Um, but okay, so I watched Chapel Wait, or at least the first two episodes, because that's all I could get to at the moment. Yeah. What about you? I I've also been watching a lot of found footage because that's just that's sort of my potato chips uh, of movie watching, where I'm like, eh, I don't know what I want to watch, so let me watch something that's going to be probably crap. Um, and so, uh, but this is not, I, I went back and watched, uh, Gonjam Haunted Asylum again. Oh man. I like that. That's on our list just because we like it so much. Yeah. And that's good stuff right there. It, that is fucking scary. That is, it one is of, yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's legitimately scary. Yeah. That's one of those found footage movies that on paper sounds like every other found footage movie, which listeners, if, if you haven't seen this movie here, the broad strokes of it is. It's a South Korean film where a team of internet-based paranormal researchers are going to explore a haunted asylum 
Stop yeah. me if you've heard this before. Right. And that probably that synopsis has turned a lot of people off, I imagine, because they're like, oh, I've seen that before. But I say, no, you haven't. Not like this. It's it's actually a good one and it's totally worth your time. Not like this. Yeah, it's it's very <laughs> It's very creepy and, and like that stuff and found footage has a rule. I think it's all about the execution. Yes, absolutely. And the execution is great. Like There's a, a solid hour where it's building up and, and I don't think that hour is boring. There's stuff that's happening and you're sort of getting to know the characters more and sort of understanding uh, what's going on with the investigation and, and that a lot of this has been staged so that they can get some views. And that's the whole deal of the movie is we've got to get to a million views. And then when supernatural shit starts popping off, it that's the stuff that's pretty terrifying. Like there's some really yeah. great visuals in that. Well, the South Koreans do not fuck around when it comes to horror. This is yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, and it's not, I was going to say ridiculous, and I don't necessarily mean that. It's not culturally specific the way that a lot of Japanese movies in particular are, that they seem kind of weird and out there just because they're sort of steeped in their own culture and and make a lot of references and head nods to stuff that's very specifically Japanese. And South Korea is a little bit more Western in its sensibility so, yeah, a lot of those South Korean movies like Train to Busan and Gon Jam and, you know, the list goes on and on. A lot of those tend to be a little more palatable, I think, for mm -hmm. Western audiences because they're, it's a little more familiar. But, yeah, it, it rocks. That's a, that is a movie that when I get to the end of it, I, I feel like my heart rate is up. Yeah, for, uh, for sure. And I can't wait to get to it on our list this year. Um. I said we. It, I put it on the list because we liked it so much. In truth, the majority of our list are movies we've already seen. You know, like Poughkeepsie Tapes, The Visit, uh, Taking of Deborah Logan. These are all things we've watched that we have seen. I did make an actual effort to put films in there that I had not seen before. And thanks to you, I was able to find some of them on Tubi because you told me about the found footage section. Or I don't know if you told me about it or if I... Mentioned, oh, I think Brandon Orlick from Exploding Heads had said it. Yeah. And then you were like, yeah, they sure do. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and I took a look and uh, I was able to peel off a couple from there that I hadn't seen before. There was one that I started watching and I, I was watching it by myself to kind of vet it ahead of time. And so I haven't seen the whole thing. Uh, I've only seen like the first five minutes and it looked pretty decent. So I put it on the list and it's like black, black. Black, black stone, black wood, black, I think it's black. I don't know. It's black something, <laughs> but it'll be on the list later on. But one that I did watch that you told me was on Prime because I'd been looking for it and I was unable to find it. And that was the Collingswood story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we did watch that one. And I have to say props to them because it came out in 2002 so it was right on the heels of Blair Witch. And it was before you got to that mid-2000s glut of really bad found footage films after Paranormal Activity, where everybody was just do excuse me, where everybody was just doing it. And this one, uh, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know anything about it going in. I just knew that I hadn't seen it before, and I wanted to see it because it was one of the early ones. So we watched it. And I have to say, I was not expecting it to be... Uh, like laptop based or like computer based. And it, the whole thing, the entire film takes place over video chat, which is really cool because it's early 2000s video chat and it's very clunky the way the internet was back then. And that was really nice. It was like, uh, it was very nostalgic, you know, for early internet. And I thought that was really cool. The unfortunate thing though, is by the time we got to the end, I was just like, oh, because it, it ended exactly the way I thought it was going to end. And I was kind of hoping that they would throw something in there and swerve me a little bit, but they didn't. But I didn't. I enjoyed my time with it. I was just hoping for something a little more out there. But I do like I give it a lot of credit for being as early as it was and for doing the whole 
video chat thing, which I thought was really cool. And there were some effective moments in there. Overall, I didn't love it, but I did like it. And I think that it has a nice historical value, which is very cool because we also just recently watched Unfriended again, which I love. I love that film. And that's like a more modern version because they use, um, not of the same thing, but it's a more modern version of like the computer-based film. And they, in that one, I love it because they use actual applications like Google and YouTube and uh, even chat roulette is thrown in there, which is really cool. Um, but this, but um, Collingswood is very basic and very simple, but I liked it for that. Like I, I thought that was neat. It's, you know, and I, like I said, I think it has some real historical value because they were able to do something like that, which was very creative at the time. I don't know of anybody at that point who had done that before. Um, like you had something like, as far as computer horror back then, we had things like Strange Land, but that doesn't really count. Um, it, it, it started out like internet based and then it turned into a whole different other thing. And then you had something like fear.com, but that's just bad. <laughs> so right. Stay alive like, is kind of in that yeah, neighborhood. Oh, oh, man, that movie just pisses me off because they have the whole Madam, uh, I was about to say Madam Bovary. They have the whole. Um, uh, what the hell? Madam Leota. Um, the, 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 um, the, you know, the lady with the blood. Um, Madam oh Bovary. Uh, no, the, <laughs> no, she would, you know, um, bathe in, in virgin blood. Uh huh. True story. But anyway, yeah, the, I, uh, I, it's weird because I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm sure listeners at home are like, you two are idiots. screaming yeah, at yeah, yeah. me. But and I, I can't, can't remember what her name is. Either. remember her name. Uh, but anyway, uh, Elizabeth Bathory. That was. Her yes. Name. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. OK, so it was based on that. But they had her in Louisiana. And I was like, what the fuck is this? So Stay Alive pisses me off just for that reason alone, just because I can't stand historical inaccuracies. <laughs> she was on vacation you know, to Louisiana. I, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, movie? You know? <laughs> but anyway, so Collingswood story we watched. And I do, I, I really enjoyed the fact that it was a really early version of, of a computer-based horror. And I thought that was kind of cool. But yeah. So thank you for telling me where to find that because I really wanted to see it. Yeah, you're welcome. I Yeah, I had much the same reaction. And I thought, I, I think I said this when I was describing it to you, but I think the the moment where they're plugging a phone line into the laptop really made me laugh. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, you can, there's a scene where you can actually see the phone line stretched. And I was like, oh, my God, those days. The other, those days. The other thing that was really funny to me about it was that the video quality of the video chat is way too good for anything connected to a telephone line. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, it's a movie and and so forth, so I get it. I'm not faulting the movie for that because it would look like absolute garbage if it looked like an actual, you know, like one of those trailers. Early 2000s video chat. I mean, hell, I remember back then just to watch a trailer, to download a trailer for... uh like when I was working, that was back when I was, uh, hell, that was even right before I started working for HM and I would have to download trailers <laughs> and, uh, stuff like that. And that took forever. Yeah. It took forever. Um, uh, they do actually make a nod to that in Collingswood where she's doing the, she drives around town and takes video and then she emails him the videos and he talks about how long it took to download. But even then they look too good. And it, I think it, it but like you said, if it, if if you didn't accept those concessions, then it would just be really bad to look at. And also it would take a really long time for anything to happen. So here's yeah. the thing I didn't know about. And was this a real thing where people had like there was like basically a yellow pages of chat people and like the psychics and stuff? I didn't know that was a thing. I never did that. I, I didn't either. Uh, maybe maybe that was real. I don't know. You know, somebody can message one of us and, and confirm or deny that. I don't know. I don't remember ever doing that. I was too busy playing, you know, Kessel Wolfenstein. And actually, yeah, honestly, actually back those then, would be I the didn't days. even have video on my computer back then. So they uh, were a little bit ahead of me. Yeah. Those were probably, in fairness, those were more the Wing Commander 3 days. 
is is where i landed uh around that time when you know all the compressed video was on the disc and it had all the quality of your real players and win amps <laughs> oh my god real player mm-hmm. and and they did actually mention oh there because at one point they're on the they're in two separate states and they're having a video chat and she's afraid to sleep at night after this whole in incident with the psychic. And so the boyfriend who is in another state, it's like, Oh, I'll just stay on video with you all night. Well, nowadays you can do that. No problem with something like Skype uh, or even Google, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't cost you any extra. It's not anything. Uh, it's not even difficult to do, but back then <laughs> internet was expensive and using any kind of application like that, was expensive. And so I'm like, seriously, they're going to sit all night on the video phone. And he, she even said, she's like, this is going to be really expensive. And he's like, it's on me. And I, I just think it's hilarious that people who weren't around back then would probably be like, what are you talking about? Like, (laughs) why would that be expensive? Because it was, (laughs) you know, because uh, in the early days of internet, you had to pay by the minute. Like Mm -hmm. you had to like buy minutes ahead of time. And then like, if you, I mean, it was just, it was like the wild west out there. And it was, it was, um, you remember like getting the discs in the mail and then like you'd use up the disc. Right. The 43 hours. And then like, all right, I, uh, now I'm moving from AOL to Mindspring. I had another 40 hours free there. And net zero came along and that was like a big deal. It just, Things were so different. And also you had the whole, it's taken up your phone line the whole time. Oh, God forbid somebody picked up the phone. (laughs) You were screwed. Yeah, it would kick you right (laughs) off. Like, oh, oh, downloading that Tenacious D episode. Oh, remember when, uh, what was it, Spirit of Christmas? The the South Park episode came out. The one that was Santa Claus versus Jesus. And that took, no lie, 48 hours to download when uh, my friends and I downloaded that. And that means you had to be off the phone (laughs) and you had to let that some bitch download for two fucking days. Mm -hmm. And if you got interrupted, you were fucked. Then you started over. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't like you you had half of it downloaded and you just started downloading the other half. You start again. Nope. You got to do it again. And it was, Oh my God, it was so unreal, but we didn't know. I mean, that was all we had. So it's not like we were, um, I mean, you, you complain about it, but then at the same time, it was also really cool, you know, because you were able to do stuff like that. But nowadays you look back 20 years later and you just laugh at it. (laughs) Yeah. I get, (laughs) I get kind of mad if I'm, you know, downloading a video game or something that's 40 gigabytes. And I'm like, 30 minutes well what am i gonna do for 30 minutes you know um yeah it, yeah. it's it's crazy but yeah, i get pissed off if i go to youtube and it, and if i hit anything and i see the word buffering anymore i'm like what the fuck is happening why do you mean buffering oh yeah i haven't had to buffer in 15 years yeah i just immediately <laughs> throw whatever i'm i'm downloading to in the into the backyard it's useless now this is a <laughs> computer for squirrels <laughs> Or I remember we would have to, uh, like, if I was watching a trailer for something, I would watch it as, and then you could watch it up to a certain point as far, however far it had buffered up to that point. And then it would stop and it would stall and it would just kind of scroll. And so you'd back up, <laughs> like back up a few minutes and let it buffer. Some yeah, more. yeah. And yeah. then you'd keep watching it. And so it would take like half an hour to watch a two minute trailer. <laughs> yeah. the Watching the original <laughs> Matrix trailer took an evening. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh man. Let me All right, so the other thing that you mentioned there was unfriended and just to throw my two cents in on that. I like unfriended, but the last time I watched it, I I I liked it less because I was more aware of how everyone in that movie is just a complete shitbag. And I no, know that's they are. I, they that's are. kind of the point, I know, but yeah. also the first time it was kind of fun because I didn't know where it was going that kind of thing. The second time it was like, oh, I know where this is headed. And also these people are intolerable. No, they are straight up pieces of shit. And, but that's what I, the thing I like about that film so much is I think that it does teach a very valuable lesson. And the <laughs> Don't unfortunate fuck with internet thing, ghosts. 
And the <laughs> I mean, apart from the supernatural bit that's thrown in there, it's very realistic. Um, everything they do is very realistic and things that you can do. Um, and then, of course, there's a supernatural angle to it. But I do think that it teaches a very important lesson, and that is that things that you do online have consequences. And just it's and if you're doing it to other people, it can, it, ha, it can have real life consequences. Like Laura Barnes ended up committing suicide because what her because of what her friends did. You know, they posted videos of her online, and then it went into this whole viral campaign of Laura Barnes kill yourself, which is just I mean, you just take any day and look at Twitter and you can find stuff like that where people just pummel people. And there's a, if they're strangers and completely separate from you online, then I don't have any issue with just turning it off and going away and just being like, all right, fuck off. I don't have to deal with you. But the thing is in this situation, they were classmates and real life friends of hers who just bullied her to the point that she ended up committing suicide. And I think it's because people don't realize that stuff like that, it, it can lead to, I mean, well, fucking suicide. It happens all the time. And the thing I like about that film is that she then comes in, her ghost comes in and forces them to reveal how shitty they are to each other. And I just, even though I know going in that they're pieces of shit, I kind of like watching them get their comeuppance. The only thing I would change about that film, if it were me writing it, is that at the very end, when the last, when Blair is the last one left, and it is revealed that she is the one who posted the video initially of Laura Barnes and started this whole thing, even though she was being completely two-faced the whole time. I mean, like, oh no, I loved you. We were like sisters. Don't you remember? You know, when that part's revealed. And then I, I really wish that Blair didn't die at the end because I think it would have been more fitting if she had been forced to live with what she had done. But then you can also look at it that uh, the last thing Laura Barnes did was post that the proof that Blair did it on Blair's page. And so even though she's not alive to suffer the consequences of those actions, her memory is tainted. Like she, it is out there and everyone knows what she did and she will forever be remembered as the piece of shit she was. So I don't know. I really, really like it. The only thing I think is unfortunate is that it is rated R and which sort of, and it doesn't, you know, we know ratings don't matter. They, they don't keep anyone from watching anything. Um, I'm thankful for that because I am the horror fan that I am because ratings didn't stop me from watching anything. But I think that if it, it could have been more effective, if it was more accessible to teens, just because teens, I think, are the ones who really need to learn that lesson. Because teens, especially today, have never lived without the Internet. They don't know what it's like to not have the Internet, which to me is a really weird thing. You know, because we spent, what, half our lives? Well, almost. The older we get, the less it is. But, <laughs> but a good chunk of our lives, we were internet free. And then, uh, then, of course, we kind of grew with the internet. But kids today, they have had it from the time they were born. And so I think it's really important for them to learn those lessons. But um, the, if you didn't have the rated R, then you couldn't have that one dick that pops up in chat roulette, which would automatically take away the realism because if you ever spent any time at all on chat roulette, there were dicks. <laughs> and I mean like actual dicks, not just dickish people. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if that's still around anymore. I have no idea, mm, but I don't, I, probably some version of it still exists, but it's just a haven for perverts and weirdos now. Oh yeah. Yeah. And anyway, but anyway, yeah, I really enjoy that one, but yeah. What, it, have you watched something? Uh, what were you going to say? I, also, I think the just to uh, provide warning, um, there is Unfriended, which is the better one. And just be warned not to confuse that with Friend Request, oh, which right. is awful. I, and it's so sad because, and here's a weird thing about Friend Request. I saw, I saw that film on Netflix originally and it was one of those 
I'm just scrolling through looking for something to watch. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. So I watched it. it wasn't very good. But after I watched it, then we started seeing trailers for it in the movie theater. And then it actually got a theatrical release after I had already seen it on Netflix. And I always thought that was really bizarre. Yeah, I think they, they gave it a theatrical release on account of some movie or another doing well. Might have even okay. been unfriended. Might have been in front unfriended. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but and that's unfortunate because I really wanted that film to be better than it was, and it just wasn't. Yeah, it it's it's stinky. Um <laughs> <laughs> the all, all right, so I finally saw Jacob's wife. Oh, nice. And maybe. I don't know. What'd you think? <laughs> um I enjoyed it. Uh I, I I know some people really lost their mind over it, and I wasn't quite in that camp. Uh, but I thought it was probably the best thing I've seen Barbara Crampton in, or the best role I've seen Barbara Crampton have since You're Next. I'll agree with that, yeah. And, it was a meaty role, too. It wasn't like a, it wasn't, you know, just a little quick pop in, here's my cameo. It was, she was the star of that film, and it was a really good role. For sure. And yeah, she definitely got to show some range and Larry Fessenden uh, does a great job of being sort of the straight man uh, for that movie and letting her really bounce off the walls uh, in, in Jacob's wife. Um, I thought it was really good. I, I, like I said, I don't, I think it falls short of being great, but I think that Barbara Crampton is just one of those actresses that I'm always happy to see in a movie, and I'm always a little disappointed that the movie she's in isn't as good as she is. And this was one of those, you know, rare but wonderful occasions where the movie is up to her level, and she gets to, you know, do some stuff. Like you were saying, you know, she's it's a meaty role, and she can go from being this kind of mousy housewife to being sort of a badass and you know she carries it off really well it's really fun and i think it was probably kate pollock who said uh i, I had mentioned to her that i was gonna watch it and she said gotta say she's got she shows a boob and it's it's holding up well and uh and she was right it was it was fascinating to see a barbara crampton boob at her age and be like wow you know, Barbara Crampton still, still keeping it tight and right. She is so beautiful. And I would love to look as good as she does at this age, much less at her age. I mean, she is stunning. Yeah. She kind of blows yeah. me away. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, and I, another thing, speaking of that, um, is that she's, like she kind of shows herself flaws and all despite the fact that i was just you know talking up her her boob um <laughs> she only shows the one but uh aside from that like you see the the spots on her skin and the wrinkles on her neck and that kind of shit like she's she's an older woman at this point and and isn't afraid to kind of show that uh, but it also makes her transformation towards the end of the movie where she is looking more glamorous, uh, a lot more fun. But I also, I like the fact that she wasn't, um, she, she was humble enough to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I am the age I am. Go ahead and show it. I don't care. You don't have to shoot me with like Vaseline on the lens, like Sybil Shepard from Moonlighting or nothing. <laughs> Yeah, and well, I do appreciate that. And I appreciate the the fact that it was it explored the sexuality of an older woman and I I like that, you know, because just because we're getting older doesn't mean that we're not women anymore. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, you know, as someone who is dating in my late 40s, you know, I I I am very familiar with that that uh sort of circumstance of like yeah well you know just because just because there's a little snow on the roof forget how the rest of that goes um <laughs> old simpson show there uh but yeah yeah it, i i like that too and i also like 
the overall theme of just because like I made this choice to be with with you speaking of Larry Fessenden's character and he does not seem to be grateful for that like he just takes her for granted and she's reaching the age where she's like well I'm just not going to be taken for granted anymore you know and it, it is a not so subtle theme of her wanting to sort of explore her options later in life that she doesn't want to live with regret and get to the end of her life and think like, well, I wasted, you know, 25 years with this guy. So why not waste another 25 more? She's like, eh, I might, might have to do something different. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, yeah. So I really enjoyed that. What about you? What else you've been watching? Uh, well, we watched the Mini Saints of Newark. Are you a Sopranos fan? Mm, I've seen some Sopranos. I have not seen the entire series. So, well, mm. I am obsessed with it. Uh, I hadn't watched really any of it until recently, and oddly, before the movie came out. Like, it's not. Um, we I started watching it just because, not because the movie was coming out, but because. Um, it was actually Brian's fault because he really liked the show when it originally aired. And he's just like, hey, I know you've been wanting to watch this. Let's start watching this now because we have HBO Max now. We've had it for a few months and it's on there. So I was like, OK, well, um, oddly, we actually got HBO Max just so we could watch. Um, oh, there was a movie, the, the not the, I keep wanting to say the Bye Bye Man, no. Um, it was the, the good one. Um, oh, shit. The Empty Man? Yes, thank you. Um, that was the only place you could watch it. And we had been trying to watch it since last year, and just, it never came anywhere else. It wasn't, you know, if you didn't see it in the theater, the very short run that it had, and you didn't have HBO Max, you're not watching that movie. So... We finally just caved and got HBO Max just so we could watch The Empty Man, which I'm very glad we did because I love that film. So that was totally worth it. But then we decided to keep it. And um, so he's like, oh, Sopranos is on here. Let's watch it. So we started watching Sopranos. And I am so obsessed with this show. We have to watch a minimum of three episodes a night. And if Brian tries to turn it before that, I'm like, you're cruel. And he's like, okay, okay. So we'll go back <laughs> and we'll, we keep watching. So now we are in a matter of weeks. Uh, I am, we just started season six. We're like three episodes, three or four episodes into season six now. And that's the last season. So I've just plowed through the entire run of this show, much like I did Breaking Bad. And I just, I love it. I mean, I'm totally obsessed with it. Well, in the midst of all this, the many saints of Newark came out. And so I went ahead and watched that because it's a prequel. And I just have to say, for people who are Sopranos fans, if you haven't seen The Many Saints of Newark, I do recommend it highly. Uh, the casting choices are so amazing. They're so good. Uh, James Gandolfini's son, Michael, plays his plays the James Gandolfini character in the film, but a younger version of him. And it, it's he looks just like him. It's so weird. It, it's it's kind of surreal uh, watching him play that role because I think he does an excellent job, but all of the casting choices are really, really good. Vera Farmiga is in the film and uh, Ray Liotta and they all do uh, Ray Liotta actually plays two parts and that they, they all do an excellent job, but all of the younger versions of the characters that you've grown to know and love from the actual series, I think just nail it. And I don't know. I like it. I think if you are a big fan of Sopranos, then you'll probably enjoy it. So I definitely recommend checking out if you haven't already. Chances are people who are big, big fans jumped on it immediately. But um, I do recommend it. And uh, yeah, so now I don't know what I'm going to do when I finish the show. I'm going to be very sad. <laughs> I'm going to have to like just tell like, all right, now we got to start all over again. He's not going to want to do that. But we have, we have a lot of other stuff we need to watch. But yeah, you just, you just go so straight into, into the wire, you know? Well, that's that's very funny because he said after this, he's like, after this, we're going to watch The Wire because that was another show I never watched. And um, 
and he like really loves that one so he's just like okay well the wire is next and so i'm ba- i'm basically going to be cleaning out all the shows that i never got a chance to watch back in the day i'm going to be going through those as we get to them and uh, the wire we actually have on dvd so yeah, uh, wire is really yeah. good especially in light of uh, michael k williams having recently passed yeah i um that's really sad i because i didn't watch this and i know he was another stuff too i actually just there was something we were watching the other day and i was like hey isn't that guy that isn't that the guy that just died and brian's like yeah he's from the wire but i don't remember what it was but it was one of his really early roles and um I was just like, I liked him though. And whatever we were watching, I was like, well, all right, I mean, I'm excited to see it, but yeah, that was kind of sad because he was pretty young. And, um, I guess if I had seen the show, then it would have a much bigger impact on me, but I hadn't seen it, but Brian was pretty sad about yeah. his passing. So. He, Oh, it's, he's so good. Uh, him and Idris Elba are kind of the two reasons to watch that show. I mean, the whole thing's good. But they are just outstanding. The character of Omar Little is truly one of the great television characters. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And and he was also recently in Lovecraft Country and was great in that, too. So, yeah, it was very sad. I, my, I understand that it was a an accidental overdose, mm-hmm. uh, some pills, and... Uh, a little bit of a Heath Ledger kind of exit, which uh, yeah. is really unfortunate. But yeah, you should watch The Wire. The Wire's good stuff, and every season is very different. Like it, it, unlike something like The Sopranos that is sort of just continuing this story. Yeah. It's like you know, season one is about I, I don't even remember that. I mean, the, the first season I really is about sort of drug trafficking. The second season is about like corruption at the dock, and the third season has this uh whole like drug zone where uh you know they basically decriminalize drugs and prostitution in a three block area to see how that goes, and all the sort of political machinations surrounding that it's it's super interesting and I mean there are characters that run through every season, but it's not. It, it's not just one narrative, um, which I really like. And and Omar is, like I said, he's amazing. He's he, he is the Robin Hood of the show. He is a drug dealer. Not even a drug dealer. He's just a thief that steals from drug dealers and is his whole character. And nice. yeah. Oh, he's so good. He, oh, Omar's the best. Um, well, now I'm all excited. Yeah. Yeah. No, The Wire is good stuff. Um I watched, speaking of pay services, on the Disney Plus, I ended up watching the Muppet Haunted Mansion. Oh, I actually saw a review of that online the other day. I haven't watched it myself, but um, but it was favorable. The review was pretty good. Did you like it? Yeah, I would kind of, eh, it, like, I think the rating I gave it was like a three star-ish kind of thing okay um which is still positive and i enjoyed it i think my problem with it is that uh i these really aren't my muppets yeah you know? well kermit's voice is different right i mean Ker- don't that like like noticeably different i mean yeah kermit's voice is very different uh scooter in particular when i heard scooter's voice i was like what the fuck is this i don't doesn't sound like Scooter. I, I'm throwing my TV out in the yard with my computer. <laughs> it's something else for the squirrels. Yeah, enjoy squirrels. I hope you like 4K and bad scooters. <laughs> but yeah, that the biggest yeah, it's one of the biggest disconnects, and it's just because you know I grew up with Jim Henson and Frank Oz, and uh, that sensibility too. You know, I mean, these were a bunch of pot smoking hippies and they had a very particular sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And there are moments in Muppet Haunted Mansion that capture that. But there are other moments that just feel like this is kind of generic kids show stuff. Uh, But here here's some stuff I like about it because I don't want to damn it with faint praise. Uh, 
the there is uh, a lot of references to the ride, and I'm a big fan of the Disney ride. Um, I I have read too much about it. I've seen too many like documentaries about it. I I love the haunted mansion. And uh, every time I go to Florida, which is every two to three ish years, uh, I'm a little overdue because of the pandemic. I don't know if you heard about that, Jamie, but there was this whole disease. Oh. Um, yeah, it's fucking crazy. Hmm. So I'm a little overdue. I'm probably going to go back in the spring. <laughs> yeah, you you ought to Google it. Uh, see what what happens. Actually, don't Google it, and definitely don't, <laughs> definitely don't look for it on YouTube. <laughs> But, uh, so I think this spring I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go back and I will absolutely, sometimes we just go to Disney long enough for me to ride the Haunted Mansion and then I'm done. Um, so, you know, I'm that kind of nerd, but, uh, the, the show does a nice job of making nods to the ride itself and, um, some of the lesser known like not exactly deep cuts but certainly like you would have to have ridden the haunted mansion a couple of times to get some of the stuff that they are uh paying homage to um okay. if you've been on the ride there's a big ballroom dancing sequence and probably my favorite bit in the whole sh the whole show was that uh they take that ballroom dancing sequence from haunted mansion and turn it into the bit from the Muppet Show, where all the couples are dancing and they crack jokes. If you remember this from the yeah, Muppet Show, yeah. so they kind of do that. Um, yeah, it, it's all right. They they have a couple of new characters uh, for this special that are pretty funny, but it's kind of Gonzo and and Pepe Rizzo. the Prawn. Oh, okay. oh yeah, not Rizzo. It's yeah, Pepe. Yeah, I did hear that uh, one of the things that the review said was that Pepe got some adult humor in there, um, particularly uh, from him. But I don't know. I haven't seen it. So I mean, that. maybe not. I, I, again, I don't have kids, so I'm not my antenna isn't up for that. But I don't remember anything that I was like, oh, heavens to Betsy. I hope that they don't. I hope no children heard that. You know, it's <laughs> it's very clearly meant for kids who were probably, you know, nine to twelve, kind of that range. Uh, it has a very simple message, uh, which is basically just, hey, you know, be sure to spend time with your friends because that's what's valuable. And, um, you know, the whole idea is that Gonzo is spending the night in this haunted mansion because... Uh, if if he turns down an opportunity to spend a night in a haunted place on Halloween, then how could he ever call himself Gonzo the Great and uh, Kermit or some bizarre facsimile of Kermit that doesn't sound like Kermit the Frog uh, tells him early on, like, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to spend a night in a haunted mansion to be Gonzo the Great. You're great without that, you know, and uh anyway so that's kind of the thrust of the story and it's it, it's totally fine it was really enjoyable um but also the caliber of guest stars felt a little weak you know like you you expect some decent cameos and i guess you know when you're in the muppet movie you get steve martin and mel brooks and richard mm -hmm. pryor and this time it's like will arnett and you know Taraji P Henson and and like actors that are totally fine, but also it's like ah, where's the George Clooney? You know, give me give me somebody that's an actual movie star. You know, give okay. me one of them Timothy Chalamets. But eh, didn't happen. So there we go. Uh, but it's it's fine. And if you've got kids, it's you know it it has fun with it being a Halloween special, and that that's what I was really looking for is. Hey, let me watch a Halloween special or something. And that was fun. Ate some, ate some birthday cake and watched it. Very cool. Ah, you just had your birthday. I did just have my birthday. I'm Happy birthday. Thank you. I'm <laughs> I'm older. Um so yeah, what about what about you? I this will probably be one of the last things we talked about. So what else you got for me? Uh, well, 
Uh, Brian got in for review Amityville Moon. Oh, right. I I I saw that floating around. All right. <laughs> yeah, that is. Let me tell you, the uh, the best thing about that film is probably the PR package that we got <laughs> because uh, it uh, came from Lionsgate and it just kind of showed up on the doorstep. They didn't tell him ahead of time. Time. Usually he knows ahead of time when something's coming, coming, but it just kind of showed up. But it had um, like really cool stuff, like a bottle of ginger beer, two bottles of of liquid death water. Um, I think there's a theme here, and um, oh, I forget, like some candles and just I don't know various things. He actually took a picture of everything and put it on his page. But it was a really cool PR packet. And I'm like, okay, well, and of course it's a werewolf film, so I'm going to watch it. So he's like, all right, I figured you'd want to watch this because it's werewolves. And I'm like, well, yeah. So I have to say it's not good. No. <laughs> now, I know it's shocking, but the werewolf is so good. The werewolf was made by uh, Kenneth Hall. Um, Kenneth J. Hall, who did uh, Puppet Master, and he also, most recently, he did the animatronics for Willy's Wonderland. And he also happens to be a good friend of mine. <laughs> so, But I didn't know that he did this film. So when I'm watching the movie, I'm like, God, man, this movie kind of blows. I mean, like, the, the acting is pretty terrible. There are some straight up, you won't believe how shitty mistakes in the film, like just shots inserted from earlier in the film, just kind of randomly inserted in the middle of an action scene later on in the film. And you're like, what, the, what, how do you even do that? Like, how do you, how do you make an editing mistake when you're doing digital? Like, I don't even know. I don't know how you do it, but the only thing I can figure is that they did it for a reason and, and maybe attempted, they were going to uh, pay it off later and then it just didn't work out. But I, I really have no, that's me trying to give them credit when I really think what they did was fuck up. But the story is extremely basic. There's nothing really all that special about it except for the werewolf effects. And they're all practical. And the werewolf looks really damn good. So it was so good that I was like, I really need to see who did the effects on this because it's impressive. And then I looked it up and I was like, it's fucking Ken. So I texted Ken's wife, who is also my friend. And I was like, hey, did Ken do this movie? And she's like, who directed it? And so I told her and she asked, you know, like she leaned over and asked him and he's like, yeah, that was me. And I'm like, oh my God, like I had no idea, but it is the best werewolf I have seen in years practical where i mean it looks so good and the 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 werewolf they actually did a practical transformation scene which you never see anymore nobody hey, does yeah, no shit uh but they did a practical transformation scene which wasn't like you know american werewolf in london but it was still pretty impressive to be a lower budget practical transformation like i just was impressed so i i would say that people who are fans of werewolves will get something out of it just because the werewolf is really solid. But as far as the rest of the film surrounding the werewolf, it's really not that good. And I hate saying that, you know, because especially knowing the person that did the effects on it, like, I don't want to be like, Oh, your movie sucked, but you know, your, but your work was good. But that's actually what I said. I was like, the movie's not good, but the werewolf looks great. <laughs> and so um, I did enjoy it for that, but uh, there's really no reason in the world for it to be an Amityville film. There is one scene where you're driving down the highway and there's an Amityville sign, like the green highway signs that go above the road. Um, there It says Amityville, like so many miles or whatever. That is really the only thing in there that says Amityville. It, it's, it just is kind of, I don't know, it's, it's bizarre. Like, I don't know why, except... Maybe they just felt the need to have another. Well, I think the director had the, the previous film he did was also an Amityville film. So I guess he's just on this Amityville kick. I think I it's why. more like, hey, when you're searching for movies on whatever streaming service that this thing eventually is going to get dumped onto. Yeah, yeah. Then Amityville is a thing that both is high on the list in terms of an alphabetical search. Yeah, and, and people recognize it. And yeah, and you say Amityville Moon, and you're like, oh, this has something to do with the Amityville horror. And no, it doesn't at yeah. all. But the 
but and that's what Brian said too. And I agree. Obviously, I think that's the reason. But horror fans know that at this point, Amityville on attacked onto a movie means nothing. Like we know that going in. And Brian's like, Yeah, but the normies don't. And I'm like, well, that's right. true. I mean, if they're looking for something to watch over Halloween and they're like, oh, Amityville, you know, it'll ding a little bell in their head somewhere mm-hmm. and then they'll they'll click on it. So that makes sense. But it just is so silly. There's no <laughs> there's like no reason for it. But, uh, you know, it, it's whatever. It's a it's a the, the werewolf looks good. You know, that, that's all I can say. <laughs> I've been listening to the audiobook uh just here and there on drives and going to bed and whatnot uh for the Amityville Horror. The OG okay. J Anson. The J Anson book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it still holds up pretty good. You know, I mean it's total yeah. it, it's a complete Bullshit. fabrication. But yeah. yeah, it's still interesting as both cultural phenomenon and also just as a horror book. Uh, no, I read it again. Uh, I've read that book three or four times, mm-hmm. you know, and I read it again not too long ago, maybe a couple years ago, and it's still effective. You know, even though I've read it multiple times and I know what happens, there are scenes in there that still get me. And uh, I remember the first time I ever read that film, I was in college and I didn't want to keep my roommate away. Well, I was actually visiting another friend who was in college at a different college. And I didn't want to keep her roommate awake, but I couldn't sleep. So I went out into the little, they had this little lobby area on the floor, on the dorm room floor. And I just went out there and I was reading it by myself and the lights are low because it's at night. And uh, I got freaked out. (laughs) The first time I read it, it it straight up freaked me out. I had to go. I was like, okay, I'm done reading for the night. I got to go back in there. But it's a good book, you know, and whether or not you like hate the Warrens or you know, however you feel about the whole thing, the whole Amityville case, I will recommend to people to read the book just because I think on its own, even if you take it as, as complete fiction, it is a good book. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I read it when I was, I don't, I, whenever I was a kid, like I, I was probably 10, 11, 12, something like that when I read it for the first time. And uh, because nobody was paying attention to what I was reading. And yeah, so I read, I, and I had like one of the old, uh, paperbacks that had the, you know, now I'm cover with the fly. Yeah. It was the (laughs) now a major motion picture and yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that one. And, uh, yeah, I read it a couple of times and it it was legit frightening. And I, I thought the, even listening to the audio book, there are a couple of moments of like when, uh, George sees, uh missy at the window with a a pig staring out the window beside her and stuff it's like ah that's creepy that's pretty that's pretty unsettling you know does anyone of note do the audio reading or is it just a a red like a random the guy who does the new kermit the frog (laughs) hey here's some demons (laughs) he says Father Mancuso. Yeah, it's uh. it, it's pretty chilling that way. Um, yeah, but I and I, I watched the movie again not long ago. Not that you know there were there were no werewolves in that one, but I watched uh, the you know seventy eight Amityville horror film. I don't know. James Brolin's kind of hairy in that film. Man, he's got a great head of hair. In fact, I was uh, <laughs> because I'm going bald. I was uh, I was sitting beside Brandy, and she was like, "I haven't seen this movie in a long time." I was like, "Yeah, James Rowland's got a real nice head of hair in this. Real jealous <laughs> of a does. good beard too. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's like he's nothing but sex appeal until he gets all greasy because he hasn't bathed." <laughs> Yeah. Of course, I don't know. I mean, you know, Johnny Depp went through that period a while back. So yeah. apparently, Jake Gyllenhaal goes through it all the time. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, that's <laughs> disgusting. Yeah, and then when he gets coated in the blood or goo or whatever from the red room, uh, he just looks like one of those moment shots characters. <laughs> but anyway uh yeah that's that's uh we're right at an hour here 
So that's probably going to do it. Uh, oh, it goes by so fast. I know. I know. Well, you know, we start talking about Amityville. And the next thing you know, we're all wrapped up. Uh, but uh, that was fun. And once again, we'll we'll be back in a month to talk about more movies. And yeah. by then, I'll have, I'll have a bunch of stuff that I can actually talk about more. Because th- this time around, even though, you know, I wasn't suffering from a lack of things to mention. But... I had, uh, I, like, I, I'm still keeping my 31 days of Halloween under wrap and oh, under wraps. Yeah. And so I haven't talked publicly about those movies. They're, they are a surprise each and every day. Well, that's a fun way to do it. 